I've never doubted the call and I've never doubted its authenticity. And curiously, even eminent people who I met once, like Cardinal Basil Hume, um, said, oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, you, you must be up there somewhere. Uh, I look forward to, to hearing more about you. So certain very eminent people did not doubt, despite official policy, that LGBT people could be clergy. When I was a teenager, this will shock everybody, I didn't go out for two years because I discovered Russian novels. I somehow was being called to witness to higher truths, to higher consciousness, by not being honest with myself. And I think I didn't actually know I was gay until having moved to London. You know, you do know. You know, but you don't 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 know. Hi my queer family, I'm Javier Lopez, hope you're all safe and sound. Today we will be talking to Reverend David Parry. David will share with us his experience as a queer pastor, coming out to his family, finding his calling and living through the AIDS epidemic. David's approach to life is one to envy with his incredible and assertive sense of humor. Hope you enjoy watching or listening to this episode as much as I enjoy recording it. How was life growing up for little David? Two things, let me add before I get into that. Um, I spent some years teaching in a number of language schools. So I've had lots of Colombian students and I was made an honorary Colombian by them at one point. Oh, so really? I've always had a magical connection with that part of the world. I've never had the chance to go. Latins, invite me over there, please. I'd love to see you. Please. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I've, I've always got very for, uh, warm and, uh, you know, formative feelings towards Colombia and Latin American countries. Um, also, I suppose I should have added, though I hate, lots of people make a big fuss of it nowadays, but, you know, I was one of the sort of early LGBT activists, um, which wasn't, a, a, a bowl of cherries. Let me let me promise everybody that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, because there were there were no precedents. And I think the trouble with the modern LGBT anger is that it's actually trying to relive the battles that we fought, but those battles are actually over. We've got to go to the next stage yeah. and get full equality and full rights. You know, marching up and down streets was not great fun. I mean, it sounds great fun, but it wasn't with the level of abuse, with the, the physical attacks, and the fact the authorities simply didn't want to know. Um, so, yeah, but I, we've got beyond that, whether we realise that as a community, as a series of communities or not, you know, we, we've actually got beyond that. We need to remember that now. Um, queer pastoring, gosh. Um, I'm from the generation of gay man, where it was intimately tied in with the British class system. The greatest poison of Britain is the class system. Um, it really has to go, but it's getting stronger by the day at the minute. So I don't know why that's resurging, this great instrument of inequality, but it's getting stronger by the day. <clears throat> and I suppose that's because of Brexit and other social phenomena. I actually think it's very complex. I don't think it's simple prejudice. I think it's very complex. And, um, you know, uh, and it wouldn't it, oh God, wouldn't it be easy if it was prejudice? Then we can all say, right, it's prejudice, we've had enough. The trouble is it's not that simple, which is why we can't do that. So I suppose if you're looking back at the original out queer homosexual lesbian group, I mean, you're looking back at the sort of Noel Cowards of the world, you know, very famous actor, comedian, singer, who everybody knew, my mother's generation knew, but it was never really discussed. Or if it came up, it was one of those, I remember it coming up once curiously between my mother and my aunt, and this sort of strange silence followed a comment because- Silence of wanted, shock. Well, yeah, you know, my mother wanted to say, he's, he's homo, he's homo, and she couldn't get it out. <laughs> you know, so, so I remember that when I was a kid. Uh, but by the time you get to my lot, I think, you know, it was 
if you're in the upper classes, you could do whatever you wanted. I mean, I met a very famous lesbian artist years back. I better not say her name. She's very, very, very famous. And she's from the aristocratic classes. And one of the best lines I ever heard when somebody said to her at this do, you know, I used to get a loads of drinks do. Oh, darling, when did you come out? I mean, she laughed and she said, oh, darling, I was never in. That's what the <laughs> servants talk about. So I remember I remembered that to this day. You know, that's gutsy. That's gutsy. And um, I suppose in my own, in my own, uh, my own experience, you know, being from the lower orders, um, you just didn't do it. So like lots of gay men in my generation, I thought I was, was one of God's celibates. That was completely separate from the feel, the feeling, the, the sensation of being called. It was nothing to do with it. Um, it would be easy to say the two were conflating each other, but they weren't. It was just separate, separate streams of feeling and experience. So, you know, I, I somehow was being called to witness to higher truths, to higher consciousness by not being honest with myself. And I think I didn't actually know I was gay until having moved to London. You know, you do know, you know, but you don't know, you know, but you don't know, you know, but you don't know. You know, I suppose it was not only repressed in me due to other people, let's not pretend otherwise, but also mm. the imagery that surrounded homosexuality in those days. You know, would anyone really want to live like that? Oh my God, no. Well, of course, yeah. You know, the ultimate if you don't mind me asking, sorry, how old were you when you moved to London, when everything... Oh God, I moved up in 82 and I'm 62 now. And remember, I was up here periodically, like everybody else before that, but an actual physical, you know, I'm now based here now. Yes, it must have been about that. And that was, oh God, doesn't it sound cliche? That was the catalyst for me being able to lead a normal life. It's normal. It's normal. You know, I, I remember thinking uh, at one point I was working in an office. My first job up here was at the, uh, I worked for the Treasury. There's an irony there somewhere. Uh, the Registry of uh, Friendly Societies and the Building Societies Commission. And I saw a couple of hot young guys and I thought, oh, my God, that means you're a puff. Um, but I, you know, I suppose that's when the country, countryside of me kicked in. If that's what you are, get on with it and have a decent life. So, you know, I, I, I'm worried for those people that can't do that because I suspect they'd be much happier, no matter how difficult it is in the short term, if they admit it to themselves and admitted it to their friends and their family, because, hey, they might all hate you, but my God, they might not, and they might get used to it. And, you know, maybe the problems with them and not with you, lead your own lives, lead loving lives and be happy. I don't know if that answers you, Harry. Is that is that any sense at all? No, yeah, yeah, of course. So how, how was that experience for you when you decided that you, you know, that you knew who you were and you were going to leave that life that way from that point onwards? Well, as I say, I mean, it, partly it's the, the country, the country boy in me. I refuse to lead a double life. You know, if that's the truth, there we are. That's the truth of it. Um, <clears throat> what we, what I did, if I look back, is I picked off my friends one by one. You know, by, by the way, I'm going, by the way, I'm going, you know, some, some face to face <laughs> and some over the phone. And you know, they were all great. And uh, London in the 80s was a very different place to what it is now. It was better in some ways. It was a lot worse in some ways. So that was taking a certain amount of personal, relational and social risks. That's, you know, um, my trouble with the LGBT, I'm almost tempted not to say it, but I think I've got to. My trouble with the present LGBT community is they have forgotten how far we progressed. Yeah. Um, it simply wasn't like that then and don't pretend otherwise. You know, you weren't being gutless if you didn't say anything. There were a lot of sanctions that you could find landing around you. Um, all right, I mean, I'll tell you a, a, a terrible story, a humorous story. I thought, right, well, I've got everybody, so I'd better tell my parents, um, who actually had a house uh, close, close to my flat, well, you know, half an hour by bus, by you know, tubes and bus, that sort of thing. So I went down there one night to pick them off. Right, let, let's get this on the table. Uh, but I'd chosen the wrong night. The angels had decided not to be on my side that night. So I went in as my mother to the house, as my mother was watching 
an episode of EastEnders. And of course, in the early days, that was quite a good show, actually. And I said, my stepfather, my, they're both passed on now. May the angels rest both of them. May the saints rest both of them. My, my uh, stepfather, who was Irish, had had a bit to drink. So, you know, I, I walked timidly into my mother and said, look, I've got something to tell you, mother, I'm gay. And uh, her reaction was, Just David, like can you please... Yeah, David, can you please shut up? I'm trying to listen to EastEnders. And I thought, right, this isn't going well. So I got to the side of her chair and said, Mother, I'm homosexual. I got the same thing again. David, I can't hear EastEnders. Can't we talk about it later? At which point my stepfather chimed in. Joan, he's trying to tell us something. And I thought, right, this isn't going well at all. So I stood in front of the TV and said, look, I'm a total queer. And don't worry about slamming the door behind me. I'll do it for you. And on the way out, I, I heard my stepfather say, what did he say, Joan? So I slammed the door for them and went, went back to the flat. And I got there and there was this sort of awful hiatus for about an hour. And then I got a phone call. This is country people for you, Harriet. This is country people. Saying, we completely disapprove, but you're still our son and we're buying you a bigger TV. So I don't know quite... Quite how that got how that came into the bargain, but that that was my experience of coming out. <laughs> um, and you know, so yeah, and you know, some people have terrible times. I don't think there's one way of doing it, and I don't think you know there's one reaction. I do think it needs to be done because in those even in those days, I was linked with Metropolitan Community Church in Ballum. Uh, there was a previous one. And, you know, some of the people we met were having their lives destroyed by not yeah. making that step. Um, so I, I, we were all very aware that not doing that led to many more problems than actually doing it. So that, that's my outing story. Nobody outed me. I'm sure that would have been much more fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, so and then, you know, you remember meeting other people. Uh, going on endless marches. Oh, I'll tell you one other story. God, there was some guy coming over from America who'd been gay. What does that mean? He said, you know, we were reading his pamphlets. He he had the cure and he could cure you. We were reading his pamphlets and you, you had to read bloody, only Americans would have a pamphlet of 15 pages. So you oh, got wow. to the end of the pamphlet where uh, he said he was coming over to cure everybody. But by the way, he he had been gay and he'd never look at men in the same way as any other man well what does that mean so we were angry and we went to we went on a march and we surrounded this uh, anglican church of england church where he was going to give his talk and channel four turned up new channel four it was sort of a, a baby in those days and we had the journalists getting out of their very expensive cars. So they came, they went to the minister first, preaching feminist. Well, she was. Um, they came to me and they got sort of a reasoned theological attitude, which they didn't want. So they went down to the lesbian with a Mohican at the end of the road. And of course, she made TV that night because that was the obvious trouble they could compare to the minister. <laughs> so, you know, we became a lot more cynical about that sort of thing. Um, certain gay groups were angry and we're going to let off, uh, we're going to open, a uh, what was it, a, a, a bucket of flies in the church. So we thought that was awful and probably a health risk. So we sent in messages because, of course, we were, we were, you know, we were barricading. So we couldn't actually go in there because if you went in there, <laughs> you, the barricade became weaker. So... <laughs> We sent a message saying, look, this is absolutely awful, you know, us being British. You've got to be careful in case flies suddenly get around the building. And they were so impressed with that, they started sending us out tea, cups of tea. So the whole thing turned very, very British. And, you know, the, the, and, and, and the man, the, somehow the man felt that the, the curer somehow felt let down that all this tea was being exchanged between the protesters and the people inside. <laughs> so I think we won. I think we won. So that was, you know, a couple of stories of the Reverend David coming out. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, David. So <clears throat> at what age did you discover that you wanted to, to follow this life that you, that, you know, that you wanted to be a pastor? How was that for you? 
Well, I, I've always known I should be a pastor. Um, I think there are <clears throat> mystical or transcendental or higher consciousness, whatever language you want to use, those are elements of life. Mm -hmm. And I personally think everyone has a calling. I think that is one calling amongst other callings. And, you know, it's really important that you find your calling. Maybe it will take your whole life. Maybe you'll discover it. When you're six, like Mozart, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Just find it. So I'd always sort of known I was meant to be doing that sort of thing. Um, my religious background, my, my mum was Church of England. So in other words, she never went to church. Uh, my stepdad was lapsed Roman Catholic, so he was always trying to push me to go to church. Bloody go yourself! Bloody go! Stop! You know, stop making me go! Bloody go yourself! Um, so, and they decided they knew there were stirrings in me. I think that was the the word the family was using at that time. Stirrings. So they decided to let me get on with it. Curiously, I always gravitated towards free church. Um, if there are religious hierarchies, I suspect they belong inside our souls, not in human society. You know, if there is a pope, I suspect that's a magical point of human consciousness inside our hearts. Maybe it's also a human being, but the important thing is it's in our hearts. So I've never really been part of the hierarchy loving establishment because I simply think it's wrong. And ironically, of course, the people that weren't into that were the Puritans. Can you have a gay Puritan? Yes, you're talking to one now. You know, so um, I explored that for a while. I, gosh, how do I get into all of that? I spent years with MCC in Balham, the previous one, years and years and years. The reason I eventually left in the end and started exploring Unitarianism, very, very beautiful people, very beautiful people. Um, was because I went to a funeral every week for a year. Wow. AIDS had suddenly hit London. Um, I will never trust a socialist as long as I live. I don't know what your politics are or the politics of your listeners. And that's said with love to you. But never. Where were you when we needed you? You didn't lift a finger. You didn't say a thing. And the attitude on both sides of Parliament back in those days Oh, well, that can of AIDS, HIV, well, that will kill a couple of queers and a couple of black people. I mean, they can die, can't they? That was the attitude on both sides of the chamber. And suddenly it started hitting the heterosexual community. I remember it to this day. We all do. All of the old timers remember it. Then something has to be done. And all these adverts were on TV about this terrible plague and there were vaccines on the way and you've got to trust the vaccines and it might remind you of something going on now. And, you know, the government will do everything it can, you hypocritical bastards. So I went to, uh, as I say, a funeral every week for a year. By the time it got to the beginning, the middle of November, um, I couldn't take any more. Um, and I said to my MCC family, Literally that, I'm sorry, I can't take any more. This, this is cracking me. I'll tell you a sad story. Um, am I talking too much, Heavy? You shut me up if I'm talking to <laughs> David, just say it. David, shut up. Shut up, for God's sake. It's so, okay, David. This hour is about you, so don't worry about it. Yeah, but you're the host and you're a lovely guy, so you know, don't be, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I... The one that cracked me, a dear friend of mine was the Reverend Michael Moffat. He was a sweet little Irish guy. Um, he was in a monogamous and completely monogamous relationship with his other half, who was also a David. Um, David had been to some sort of conference on business, um, had a bit to drink, and had a one-night stand, which was completely out of character and contracted AIDS HIV. He didn't know that um, and gave it to Michael. We saw David die very quickly in front of all of us. It's not a pretty sight. It's not a pretty sight. Um, there wasn't a dry eye in the church, in the house on that particular evening. No one could believe it had happened so quickly and so ruthlessly. And our dear little friend, our wonderful friend, Michael, who was finishing his PhD in theology at King's College London, we watched him wither away like a browning leaf. Uh, we all went to the hospital a couple of times individually. And then he passed on too, and we went to the funeral. 
And that was it. That was the one that cracked me. Two sweet people that had done no harm and no wrong to anyone that had been got by a disease that the government, no, it couldn't have prevented it, but it could, it could have done a lot more about it. So, and it did nothing, as I say, which is why I remain quite sceptical of leftist and progressive initiatives, unless they mean them. Um, but I, I don't trust politicians, no matter what they say they are. So that's part of my experience, and that's an experience that, that stays with me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's... I experimented a little with Gnosticism. Um, I, one of my, I've got a load of consecrations because I, I don't believe religion is just a body of ideas that you swallow. Um, religion is like a finger pointing at the moon. It's a series of mysteries pointing somewhere else. If you think uh, you just swallow what your family says, you haven't understood religion. If you think it's just a, a group of ideas, a body of ideas, good for you, but you haven't understand religion because it's not stirred your spirit, it's not stirred your heart. And hey, it's not just a thing about feeling and it's not just about imagination. It's something deeper, but involved with all of them. Uh, if you have that sort of view, and I've always had that view. So I went searching, you know, what does all this mean? All these deaths, all this sadness, what does it all mean? Never doubted Christianity, but I knew the sort of Christianity I was dealing with was whether they realized it or not themselves was very shallow. And it was people going through the motions and it was people telling each other nice stories without the slightest understanding of what those stories meant. Not really. Um, so I was talking to a group of Valentinian Gnostics in Italy for a year and was eventually consecrated as a Valentinian uh, Gnostic practitioner in a monastery in Italy, a very beautiful ceremony. Um, I curiously, I was contacted a couple. Of, um, they're not the Roman Catholic Church. There's a big difference. The the old Catholic Church are the ones that refuse to be told what to think, and they broke away from Rome a couple of centuries ago. They said, "Still wasn't me. I'm not. I'm not a hierarchies person." Yes, my lord. No, my lord. Oh no, no that's not me. That's not me. So I eventually went back to free church. And of course, at the moment, I've actually reopened or I founded, depending how you look at it, a new metropolitan community church oasis in uh, South London, in Balham again, called Valentine's Hall, where, you know, I've got a Zen approach. You know, it's not about what you think. Have you, have you found Buddha? Have you found Christ? You know, uh, if not, then don't pretend you have. You know, have you found this amazing reality in your own life? If not, don't think you're doing religion. You're simply not. And anyone that tells you, no, just agree with what the church says and keep putting your hand in your pocket. No, 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 no. That's not the idea. <laughs> like, at most all. People do. like most people do. Yeah. So we, we, I mean, we're, we're in a strange position at the moment. We've got a number of churches following us in Kenya. How on earth did that happen? Yeah. And um, we're, we're negotiating with MCC in America because, of course, it's a remarkable denomination that grew out of the civil rights movement in America. It grew out directly from Fire Island and Stonewall. So we were part of the history. Um, you know, there was, there was the black insurgents, there was the gay insurgents, and they went hand in hand in those days when minorities had finally had enough. You know, we're not being told we're second class sinners. We're not being told we're second class citizens. We're not being told we're less than you because it's not true. So MCC comes out of that milieu. Um, and I'm trying to reintroduce it through Valentine's Hall, a little church in South London, where everybody's welcome. You know, be of whatever faith you want. Be of no faith. You're welcome at our table and you're welcome to visit us. Uh, just don't hold the minister up for hours on end with pointless questions because he's a busy guy. Um, you know, but we, we love seeing it. At the moment, we can hold, only hold service once a month because of the obvious restrictions. But, you know, we're going from strength to strength and... It's just simply not true that the other churches hate you. Some of them don't, oh, right, this is me telling tales. Some of them don't understand you. I mean, we, we're housed at the moment in the Kalos Centre. Um, very, very wonderful hosts, so you mustn't get me wrong. But there was there was that sort of comment when, when we, we, we turned up. Any gay person knows what I mean by that sort of comment. You know, when we first, we were, we were housed as a meditation circle in St Peter's, 
Anglo-Catholic Church for a couple of years and we felt, well, that's not good enough. Partly because every time it rained, we'd all get soaked because the rain kept coming through the walls. So thank you. Yeah, we can't do that anymore. So we found this wonderful home in the Kalos Centre and the, the minister was walking around with the church secretary. We feel very at home. If you're listening, Des, we feel very at home. You know, and I noticed him saying, oh, but what church are you? So I thought, right, this is where it goes pear-shaped. And I said, well, we're actually Metropolitan Community Church. And there was this sort of sudden halt in conversation. And then he said in that sort of way, oh, you know who that is, blah, blah, blah. There was a church like them a couple of years ago down the road. Then she looked in that knowing way. I thought, for God's sake, you know, just come out and say it. So anyway, um, we thought we, we may not have found a wonderful home, but we found a wonderful home. And Des, I believe, is from Brazil. So, hey, you know, it's a gathering of the clans and having fun. What can you say? So following on the topic of being queer and a pastor, how has the rest of society treated you? Because some people might not think being a reverend goes with, you know, being queer or being gay. Have you experienced discrimination? Have you have any, um, had any struggles with certain communities or some personal issues because of their line and the path that you have chosen? Oh, I mean, yeah, obviously the answer is yes. You know, I mean, certainly there have been career options that mysteriously haven't materialised. You know, it took me years to realise that unfulfilled promises in terms of career, sometimes within the church, you know, if you join us, Reverend, we will do A, B, C and D and then nothing happens. Mm. You know, I mean, that's an invisible sort of prejudice. They never actually say it because, of course, you can, you can take them to court. But, you know, the fact the the wonderful opportunity never materialises, it took me ages to realise, ah, it's homophobia, and they're actually disguising it. You know, oh, no, we haven't had time, we've not got the budget, we'd love to accommodate you, but, you know, in the present circumstances, so yes. Um, yeah, I mean, including the gay community, some people think it's gays versus the church. Um, and, I, God, of course I can understand that. You know, with the way we've been treated for centuries, of course I can. But the point is, you're not bloody pushing this pastor out of Christianity or the church. We've every right to be there. So I can understand that the hurt uh, experienced by so many LGBT people. And I love you all. I want to hug you all. And yeah, I know, I know, I know. But, you know, my attitude is twofold. Um, we have every bloody right to be Christians and to be included. And no one's telling us we don't. I remember going on a Pride March years ago where some of the people uh, were singing Christian hymns and some of the other gay participants looked unsettled. And my own attitude was sadness because what I saw was an assertion uh, of community identity. I didn't see us being, you know, what's that horrible phrase, Uncle Tom's? I didn't see us, you know, begging for permission because we were never, we were never given permission. Well, in fact, if anything, we were pushed out. So I saw that as a huge statement of revolution. We will be what we want to be, and we're doing it with love, and we're doing it with wisdom. So that, for me, was a re you know, re revolution. Um, in terms of the straight community, it's a very mixed bag. I mean, certainly... In the 80s, they were, they were, I don't particularly trust liberals either, to be honest, although I count myself as a liberal. Um, you know, everything would be all right at first, and then they'd think about it. And you'd think, hang on, what are you thinking about? It's not, you know, I don't need your approval. Yeah. I don't need you to, you know, well, oh, that's, you know, you're, you're one of the nicest people we know. You know, sod off. How dare you condescend to me in that sort of way? So, you know, I, I mean, the, curiously, it was the right wing. I mean, I, I, I played right wing gigs because if they hate you, they hate you and they tell you. And if they don't hate you, they think you're interesting and come along and tell us what your experience is. So if anything, the world is topsy-turvy as usual. And, you know, so in the old days, in the early days, it was a very mixed bag and you never quite knew what you were in for. Um, 
Do you think maybe, David, some people might be biased because you're a pastor? You know, they might they might be against you being gay, but because you're a pastor, they might kind of say, okay, it's okay, he's a pastor. He can he can be here, you know. Well, you've actually hit something very important there. I actually don't think anyone's ever discriminated against me because of being a pastor. What they don't like is the gay, the queer pastor progressing. That's what they don't like. Because then that's the thumbs up. That's the green light. So, yeah, well, I mean, I think I've heard of stories where basically people who were called by God, the, the straight society is even telling God what to do now, you know. So he, he, she will never be admitted, uh, consecrated as a pastor because that's the green light. I've known a couple of people. I think that that's, you know, that's the only type of explanation for their experience. They should have been pastors and they would have been incredible, but it didn't happen. Um, for me, I, you know, for, because it's a strange set of circumstances and everybody's got their own, you know, their own karma. They've got their own baggage. They've got their own destiny. They've got their own fate. For me, that didn't happen, although I suspected that it, the process was held up for a couple of years. But uh, that actually is only a suspicion. I can't put my finger on anything there, and it might just be paranoia. Uh, no, I don't think really that happened in my case. But in my case, certainly, the attitude was, OK, you're a queer pastor, but no further. Because then, then you, you know, it shows that you people can progress and lead ordinary, decent lives. And that really is the modern prejudice. Mm. You know, I, I, you, if I had a pound coin for every drag queen I know personally, I would be a very rich man. Society puts up with that. You know, oh, look, it's the LGBT mob being colourful and magical and crazy and wonderful. And we are. We're magical and wonderful. But if you turn up in a business suit or a clerical collar or a business dress and you want entry into the main system because you deserve it, because you've got talent, because you've got brains and because you've got more willpower and drive than all the other board members put together, that's where the prejudice kicks in nowadays. You know, oh, a very good man. Oh, oh, a wonderful woman. But I mean, is she really suited for this company? That's the sort of thing that happens nowadays, which is why I think as a community, we've got to remember the early angst days of, you know, will I be accepted or not on a face-to-face -face basis, on a one-to-one -one basis? That has gone. And remember, the law is on our side nowadays, whether the Church of England likes it or not. Whether I mean, remember, every Church of England church is a government building. The church, yeah. we have a, a registered church in this country, a state church. Therefore, that is an arm of government. And you have bishops, the Lord's spiritual in Parliament, representing that type of governance in our society you know the fact that they cannot come to the terms with the fact the law of the land is on our side now and you've got irritating people like me saying by the way if you look at the bible more carefully and not just in english where is the problem with gays you know why, why are they keeping quiet about all of that so no I th as a community we've got to be less worried i suspect about problems that we did have we did have them back then but we don't have them now because hey if anyone's prejudiced to me i'll see them in court and i'll be off to hawaii with the proceedings as quickly as i can and drinking strawberry daiquiris on the beach ha got you but you see the prejudice doesn't work that way now it works differently is it still there yes i personally think it's coming back one of, the, one of the reasons I was quiet for about 10 years, because somebody pointed it out curiously the other day, why were you quiet about the LGBT issue, the queer issue, and anti-Semitism for so many years? And I'll tell everybody, I thought those things were just mindless and childish, and they'd all gone away. But they haven't, they're coming back, and it's time for us to go back to the barricades. I can't believe I'm saying it. And, you know, say no, no but not to the same barricades. The initial ones were successful and we won. Nowadays, the barricades are a lot more subtle and they're in boardrooms and they're in businesses and they're in people not willing to give the ultimately talented person, the perfect guy or woman for the, the perfect trans for the job 
that's when the prejudice kicks in. I'll, I'll say one more story, then I'll shut up. My dear friend is a, a trans writer, Jean Winchester. Um, she is an extraordinary talent. Um, she has, has written about 40 books, and they're big. They're big books. They're not tiny. They're not thin. Um, even certain American academias. I don't think much of academia at the moment, but that's another, that's another issue. Um, you know, how many times can you say the same thing and get funding for it? For God's sake. Anyway, you know, I mean, she is an accomplished author by anyone's description, and she's received nothing, no acclaim, no awards, nothing. And you think, ah, oh, that's because she's trans from that generation. If you turn up now and you're loud, they're afraid. And good, be afraid, we've had enough. But they still think they can get away with it on the boundaries, on a generational level. And that's where, you know, we should be alerted to the fact that the prejudices are still there. And we mustn't put up with them. No matter what, for our own self-respect and our integrity, we mustn't put up with them because God is love and the angels are on our side. And that's the end of it. So, yeah, that's a long-winded answer of saying, yeah, they, I, I think lots of people would have found it self-contradictory for themselves, for their own understanding with the type of person that I am, if I wasn't recognised as a pastor. But I can still sense, you know, at the back of their minds, you can see it in their eyes sometimes, this is as far as you go because it's sending out all the wrong signals otherwise, you know. So, again, yeah. that's my answer to that and... We've all got to be more gutsy. We've all got to be more gutsy. Obviously, you have been doing this for many, many, many years. And I'm sure this has happened to you many times when you said just now that in the back of their minds, people, you know, are judging you. Um, it seems like you have moved on from that feeling and you don't really pay much attention to what people think in that sense, you're there to do your job as a pastor, to teach them, to guide them, to tell them. Um, you touched on a couple of important points about the Bible earlier, and people use constantly the Bible as a weapon, but they pick and choose what they need from the Bible to actually hurt you. Yeah. Um, it doesn't work like that. You know, if yeah. you're going to use it and then read the whole thing, understand it, yeah. But if you go back a little bit, why are you using the Bible as a weapon to hurt people? Yeah. You know, it shouldn't be used that way. Also, the LGBT community is a massive community. We have room for everybody to just come in and be part of this amazing community and be whoever they want to be, whether they want to be trans, whether they want to be a queer pastor, whether they want to be gay or lesbian or whatever. That's the beauty of, of our own, you know, space. Sadly, sometimes we get people that don't agree within the same community. Like, I'm sure you have had that in the past. But it is a work in progress, and we are continuing, you know, doing this work, like yourself, like myself, with this platform, sharing the information and the knowledge and the experiences from people like you for the other ones listening. And hopefully they can identify a little bit with that and understand that we are just all humans part of this world and we can just all cohabit like, you know, like family that we are in the, in the same place. Uh, so thank you very much for, for sharing your amazing, you know, experiences and stories. Just to close up a little bit, what has been the best advice that you have been given throughout your whole life? Whether that's because you're gay, because you're a pastor, your family or because of all of the above? Gosh, curiously, it was a Jesuit priest. Um, one of my best friends is a Jesuit priest in America and a professor of philosophy, the Reverend Dr. Robert McTeague of the Society of Jesus. How about that for a mouthful? Um, who said to me years ago, oh, look, just be yourself. And I so I thought, well, there we are. You know, you can't get much more, more sort of the horse's mouth than Jesuit is telling you to be yourself. So he turned into a very good friend of mine. And yeah, that's the best advice. It's not always easy, I know. Uh, you know, but be wise. Be wise with your timing. You know, if you suddenly realise you're trans, as an example, and you, know, and you turn up to breakfast the next day wearing a purple wig, 
and a huge bra, then yes, you probably will get some flack, you know, only because it's a shock. You know, yeah. let's, let's be wise in our choices and loving to the people around us who simply may not understand. And that's when we have to be loving and say, look, you know, this, this is me. It's not unusual. It's not frightening. It's not terrible. And, you know, you know, just accept me as I am and be tolerant. You know, if, we, if we're wise with our choices, I suspect the world will become a much better place and much sooner than we think it is. And it shows like this and people like you that are doing such an amazing job. I did a bit of research on this show before um, I was connected with it. And I realized what a hugely positive impact this, this show is having. You're in my prayers and I'm sending my love and the love of Valentine's Hall to you, young Javier, and all of the people that listen to this remarkable show. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I always say, like you just mentioned right now, you know, being yourself, it is simple, but it's also one of the hardest things that you ever going to have to do in your life. But once you do it, you're going to feel like a massive weight. It's just going off your shoulders. It's just taking that first step is the hardest part. I do agree with what you said. You know, some, some of us have to be smart with the way we show ourselves. Because sadly, there's still people out there that don't agree with the happiness of others. And that's, yeah. going to be, it, you know, that's always going to be a problem unfortunately but we yeah. just have to keep pushing back keep fighting keep being ourselves and, and hopefully at some point eventually that's going to change so just to finally close up what advice just to reverse the question now what advice would you give to somebody that's right now having some concerns in regards to their sexuality or their identity i understand that in your particular case you didn't have any struggles or it seemed like you didn't have any struggle accepting yourself. Um, you assimilated that to being a country boy and that's who you are. And you just, and, and they just, and you just went and did it, but other people might not feel that way. So what would you advise to somebody like that? Gosh, curiously, that's an easy one. Uh, let the angel of time give you advice. Don't rush it. Take a tiny step at a time. Be happy with yourself. Check every single inch forward. Have I done the right thing in the right way? If you haven't done it, take a step back. Don't be afraid. Sometimes taking a step back means you can leap forward the next time. Let the angel of time guide you. Be patient with yourself. Be loving to everyone around you. And remember... It might be their ignorance that's the problem, not your own. But, you know, give things time. Give things time. That's great. Thank you. I actually never thought about it that way because most people straight away, they give you an answer of an advice that they think it might help others. But I think it's important, in the, you know, also to acknowledge what you just said now about time, giving yourself the space and the time to actually think and digest what you're going through at that moment and then taking a step back or taking a step forward I think it's really important for people to understand that a little bit more so thank you very much for that um so with that we are going to close um the episode David thank you very much again for your time for sharing your experiences um your amazing experiences and stories with us and hope to see you on another episode very soon I'd be deeply honoured. Um, everyone in Colombia is my brother and sister. <laughs> no, I'd love to. I'd love to have you. Whenever you want the short, fat pastor to come back, just, just give me a buzz and I'll be here. <laughs> I will do, David. Thank you very much for your time and have a great evening. Thank you for listening. And if you want to stay in touch, you can find me on Instagram at MQFPD. Until next time.